Right, it's a lovely Columbia record. This is uh, William McCulloch, who uh, told stories and, and did monologues, that sort of thing. Recording from the 1940s. This is uh, part one, Agnes Has a Surprise. The greatest surprise of the night was when Agnes's father turned up sober. Oh, he looked so different. His own dad tried to bite him. Even his wife didn't know him until he spoke, and then she collapsed into a state of fear exhaustion. However, that night everybody provided their own food, and we got a very agreeable surprise when we found that all the men had brought the identical kind of food. Different blends, you know, but all of the same denomination. The awkward thing was getting rid of the empty bottle. That's the great evil about drink. Not so much the harm it does, or the money wasted, but the getting rid of the empties. It's quite different with food. You can always eat up the extra bread, but you can't eat up the empty bottles, except you're a sword swallower. There was only one of our people at the party, Willie Paul. And maybe he can swallow a sword, but Aggie's home-baked scones fair put the peter on him. He just ate one and he had to go home early with a sinking feeling in his inside. Yon scone would sink the whale that Jonah swallowed. Agnes lived in the country, so we had an old ramshackle cub. The horse was blind and its knees were chapping ten o'clock. They told me it was steady. Steady, it was almost motionless. After a bit of shoving and pushing, we got it started and we went bowling along at a furious rate, nearly overtaking two walking funerals and a couple of thin legged pensioners going to the dancing class. We stopped at a pub for a minute, I think it was for more petrol, and when we came out, only an hour later, here was the old nag lying in a humplock in the middle of the road. Please, Mr. A wee chap says, your horse has fell. Actually, says I, you must have been leaning on it. Being Halloween, everybody was disguised, but even to mask the tea. We all wore a false face so as to appear funny looking for there was a prize for the most comical pan. Agnes was an easy first. And the remarkable thing was that she just wore her own face without any attempt at disguising. These false faces were very misleading. I wasted a whole hour making love to my own wife before I found out my mistake. Every time there was a lull in the proceedings, we had another drink. There were more lulls than proceedings. But every refreshment was very acceptable to all except the minister, Mr. Skingles. Yon's an awful name to call anybody. It's like a skin trouble. After a bit, George disappeared. So I lay down on the floor to look for him. And do you know I couldn't get up again? Agnes said it was drink. But it couldn't be that. For I'd only nine. Right, uh, side two of this Columbia record. <coughs> uh, talking by William McCulloch, a uh, humorist, monologist and storyteller. Uh, recording from somewhere around probably uh, 1943, I believe. And uh, Agnes has a surprise party, part two. Oh, I forgot to tell you that the minister turned up and helped greatly to spoil the night. A clergyman is all right in his proper spear, but a perfect fest at a party. Every time we had another drink, he ran into the kitchen and started to greet. <laughs> well, we kept him running. It was good exercise for the soul. Him and his tears were nearly to bail out the kitchen. He says to me, how can you bear the taste of drink? Oh, says I, it's not for the taste I like it, it's for the fine ideas it puts in my head. We played at burning nuts, which we put into the fire with the aid of a pair of hand-embroidered brass tongs. Each nut represented someone present, and we watched to see if they would jump together. If they did, they loved each other. If they went and popped apart, it signified a broken heart. It was great how these common or garden nuts carried on. Do you know they couldn't have been more human if they'd been monkey nuts? Jean Bide went away with Charlie Gibb, Annie Buck went away with Geordie Ben, and her Uncle Bob from Aberdeen, he went away with the brass tongs. Then we duped for April. You leaned over a bine of water and saw your feet at the bottom. Bella McWumple was that anxious to see her future husband that she leaned over too far and fell into the washing bine. Poor Bella, Aggie's why didn't she burst out laughing? And the minister checked her and said, it is a solemn thing to be married. Oh, she says it's far more solemn not to be married. During the church convention, her mother gave hospitality to two of the delegates, and she said to me, I'm just kept on the throat with the locust preachers. Oh, I said, you mean local preachers. Locusts are things that come in swarms and eat everything up. Exactly, she says, well, I've got two of them living with me, the new. Then Bella would sing. We tried everything, but nothing would prevent her. I believe at her own funeral, she'd be wanting to sing a duet with the undertaker. And she can sing name. Down in the low notes, it sounded like a gargle. Up in the high notes, it was like 50 cats with their tails in a mango. 
She started within a mile of Edinburgh tune and finished that about Berwick and Tweed. Of course, we've all got our own peculiarities. Some thirst after money and some thirst after love. But I know something all men thirst after, and that is after short hearing. When we broke up, George brought out his all kirt, and one by one the guests were carried home. He said to me, I'll not go and do no stair with you in case I can't get up again. And listen, when you go out at the door, you'll see two kirts, but at the first thing, the others know they are. 